Sorry. Welcome back or welcome to the symposium if you're only tuning in now. My name is Ellen and I also work for the program uh, and I will be your master of ceremonies for the second session, which is about to begin. Uh, in this session, we will reflect on the struggles of sustaining project impacts beyond project timelines. Uh, so a bit of housekeeping before we begin. During the presentations, please feel free to express yourself in the chat and to share insights with each other. However, if you have questions for the speakers, then please place them in the Q&A feature of Zoom located in the toolbar and mention the name of the speaker. Um, feel free to also ask your questions in French. We will translate these to the panelists. Um, luckily, we're not up to my fr French th translation skills, so we have French translators on the scene. Um, and then after all the presentations are over, we will use the remaining time for discussion. During this period, you can also use the raise hand feature to ask your questions or to share reflections. Uh, we will then also address questions from the Q&A box, so please feel free to submit your questions there if you prefer. Uh, we will also be keeping the time for the presenters. So after eight minutes, you will hear a ring or a little bell, which indicates that you still have two minutes left to speak. And then um, we will ring a bell again for a total of 10 minutes. So let's begin our session, our second session called Sustainability of Impact. Uh, I would like to introduce first the moderator as well as the rapporteur. So firstly, I would like to introduce Micha Werner, which is the moderator for this session. Uh, Micha's research interests are the application of hydrological knowledge, data and models in operational ma water management with a focus on hydrological extremes such as droughts and floods, but also on water allocation and reservoir operation. With an interest in, in, in interdisciplinary research, he formerly worked at Delta Addis as a senior hydrologist. He is an active member of the scientific community as part of several research groups and serves as editor to the Hydrology and Earth Systems Sciences Journal. Then our rapporteur is Labo Mahole. And Dr. Mahole is a senior lecturer at the University of Botswana's Department of Architecture and Planning. She is a regional development planner by profession uh, with, a manage, uh, with a master in city planning. She has done a PhD in development studies, more specifically environmental policy analysis at the University of East Anglia in the UK. Her research focuses on natural resource governance, in particular, the management of law, uh, land and water commons. She also works on adaptation and resilience of communities to climate variability and change. Dr. Mahole is an environmental policy analyst and policy planning processes facilitator with a vast experience in stakeholder engagement and strategy planning, as well as fa facilitating mediations, negotiations, conflict resolution, and env empowerment. So we are very honored for your support during this session. So thank you very much. And uh, we are excited to see what's to come. So I'll gladly hand over the floor to Micha. Thank you so much, Ellen. And um... Good, uh, good afternoon, good morning, good evening to all, and welcome to this uh, session on sustainability of impact. And I think this is a particularly exciting discussion, and I'm sure as you all agree, as I think most of us who are gathered here that we're involved in, in you know, that- Micha, some, we yes. cannot hear you. Oh, that is a problem. I'm sorry. Just check. Oh. Um, can hear you well. Yes, yes, we hear Yeltsin. you. <laughs> it may be yourself, Yeltsin. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Maybe if someone could be so good as to send Yeltsin an email that it may be on her side uh, or a <laughs> message. Thank you. So I did. I'll continue. I think we, you know, I think all of us gathered here are very, you know, passionate about the work that we do and and how we contribute to facing, you know, the, the, the challenges that climate variability and limited resources pose and, and, and working on trying to improve people's livelihoods, particularly of the most um, vulnerable. So we you know, are really passionate about achieving impacts on the ground. But at the same time, we know that really achieving impacts is, is very challenging. And in particular, um, achieving impacts that are sustainable. And um, and I'm sure that you know in our work we've all had successes and and um, and but also need to acknowledge that there's some things that yeah have, may may not have worked quite as well as we as we had hoped and they would um, um, when we started out. 
and um, and there may be all sorts of barriers to uh, to achieving um, impact sustainably. You know, be they financial, be they capacity issues, institutional things that are maybe completely out of our control, such as or could be out of our control, such as politically, but may also be you know how we actually design and implement projects, and um, and how we build truly lasting partnerships, which I think is very much you know something that we we're trying to do here. And so I'm really excited to be moderating this session with three uh, great speakers. And I'm also very excited to uh, be doing this together with uh, Dr. Lapo Hang Makola from, uh, from the University of Botswana. So Lapo, I thought it'd be really nice uh, if you would also maybe would like to add a few words on your thoughts to this. See you coming on. Good very afternoon, much. Lapo. Greetings all. Um, it's evening here. Uh, Greetings uh, in all your times um, of the world times that are different. Um, yes, my name is Lapu Mahole and uh, I'll be um, repertoire in this session. And uh, I'm just excited that we've come to this point because I would just simply say indeed about time. Um, and I like uh, the other caption that is within the, the title of this uh, session. It is uh, sustainability of impacts, but it says reporting, uh, no, beyond reporting impacts, because really reporting can be quite superficial. We all know. We all know that we can you know, have our log frames, plan to do things, and then tick boxes thereafter. But then we are having a good and timely conversation about the impact. Did we tick boxes because we just did things, or did we tick box because indeed there was a lasting impact to what we implemented? So I'm excited to hear from the speakers, and I believe that we will all learn from each other because I know that we have a common interest in lasting impact. Um, thank you. Thanks so much, Lapo, and we're looking forward to hearing more of your reflections later. So with that, I'd like to introduce the first speaker of the session, the first of three, Dr. Klaus Schwartz. Um, he is an associate professor here at, uh, um, at IHE Delft uh, in urban water governance and in the Department of Water Governance also. And uh, his main expertise is, uh, on, or his main concerns are on water services governance, um, public water utilities and reform and informal water services provision. So, class, the floor is yours for the next 10 minutes. Thank you very much, uh, Micha. Um, let me... Okay, maybe you can share. If you can pop it up. There you go. Perfect. Take it away. Yep. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, so in the next 10 minutes, I would like to... Uh... Hi. Sorry, just some housekeeping before we begin class. Sorry about this. Yep. Um, is anybody else in the audience having issues with hearing the French translation? Those who are French speakers? If you're having issues with the French translation, please let us know. Thanks, Ayn. Can we continue? I think I'll continue, class. Yep. Thanks. Okay. Um, in, yep. In, in, in the next 10 minutes, um, I would like to uh, discuss a, uh, a project activity that we have been undertaking in the past about six years, seven years. It's part of a project called the Boosting Effectiveness of Water Operator Partnerships. Um, and I would particularly like to focus on the activity of establishing and maintaining uh, communities of practice as part of this project. The project itself, BWOP, is a project that is a joint project of IHE Delft and the Global Water Operators Partnership Alliance, which is part of uh, UN Habitat. And it's a it's a project which has uh, which has been running for about ten years now. Um, and in the past seven years, we have tried to establish communities of practice as part of that project. Um, maybe as an introduction. Uh, water operator partnerships are defined as being solidarity-based peer support exchanges between two or more water operators on a non-for-profit basis aimed at strengthening capacity and enhancing performance. Basically, the idea is that utilities, water utilities, water operators can learn from each other by sharing experiences, sharing knowledge, um, and in doing so, uh, strengthen and capacitate uh, other water utilities. Um, currently, there are about 
worldwide about 400 water operator partnerships that are registered. There are probably more water operator partnerships, but not all uh, are visible on the radar of uh, GVOPA, the Global Water Operator Partnership Alliance. So we have 400 partnerships. And at the same time, a lot of these water utilities, they face similar challenges, similar issues. And also within these partnerships, a lot of the challenges and issues that occur or that need to be dealt with within these partnerships are actually quite similar. So rather than having 400 separate projects, the idea was, okay, how do we make sure that the, that these partnerships uh, learn from each other? How can they share experiences? How can they make sure that they don't have to reinvent the wheel every time a partnership is established and, uh, uh, and develops? And so the idea was we could establish communities of practice, which sort of go across these 400 partnerships. And these communities of practice, the idea is that within this community, uh, members can exchange knowledge, they can share experiences, they can uh, bring questions, they can in get involved in discussions, in debates. Um, and the idea is that these communities of practice thus sort of form a uh, connection between these 400 different partnerships. Um, we started with eight communities of practice in uh, 2016. Uh, we started with about 100 members, and initially these communities of practice were hosted by uh, by IHC Delft and developed also in collaboration with uh, the Waterworks program. And the Waterworks program is the program of water operator partnerships that the Dutch water supply sector has uh, initiated in 2016 and which will run until 2030. Currently, we have nine communities of practice and we have about 1,200 members uh, of these communities of practice. Um, the communities of practice are currently hosted by the Global Water Operator Partnerships Alliance. And what you see here are sort of the topics uh, of the individual communities of practice. So the different communities of practice have a particular focus related to uh, water supply and sanitation services. Um, the community of practice itself, uh, a lot happens through a platform. So we have sort of a, a Facebook-like uh, platform in which a lot of information is posted, in which uh, people can uh, visit, they can post questions, they can post uh, anything basically that they would like. Um, at the same time, we also use that platform for a lot of events or activities that we organize. So there are webinars, there are short courses, uh, project updates uh, in, in all so far in 2023. Across the uh, the nine communities of practice, we've had about, uh, I think, at currently about 60 events. And I'm assuming that by the end of 2023, we will have about 80 events, webinars, courses, etc., uh, on these different communities of practice. Uh, we've also done surveys among the members, and the members are generally quite satisfied with the communities of practice. And what is interesting particularly is that the events that are organized um, are only sort of the visible activities of the communities of practice. But behind the scenes, under the water, a lot of uh, interaction takes place between members. So they have developed a personal network and they will approach each other directly rather than using the uh, the platform that we have. Um, so in this sense, it it, it all looks very positive and, uh, and, and, and very, uh, yeah, very good, but there is, but there are some some questions and some problems related to the, the the functioning of these communities of practice, and the first is what they call the ninety nine one rule, which apparently applies to all communities of practice, and basically what it means is that ninety percent of the members of a community of practice are going to be passive members. Nine percent can be, with some uh, effort, mobilized to occasionally. Uh, be active and provide a contribution. And only 1% of communities of practice will actually be active all the time. And what we notice from the members is that there is an interest in learning and, and 
there's an interest in, in passive participation, but there is relatively little interest in active involvement and in becoming involved in moderation or facilitation of the community of practice. If, if we take the, the 99 one rule as sort of a, a given, what it means is that for these communities of practice to really become sustainable, uh, they need to be extremely large. So rather than the 1,200 members that we have at the moment, we would probably need about 12,000 members if these communities of practice were to be self-sustaining. Um, what is currently happening is that the lack of involvement of members is addressed through project funding. So we have project funding both for Waterworks and through the Beevil project, uh, which allows for a team of moderators to organize activities, to organize webinars, to organize short courses, and to provide content which draws people to the community of practice. Um, but it's all currently, or all, a large, par a large part of it is, uh, is, is funded by, uh, by external projects. Um, what are some of the problems? So these communities of practice, they focus on water utilities and most of the members are practitioners. They are basically water utility staff. And water utility staff in most countries do not necessarily come to the office and switch on computers. They will come to the office and start working on operation, maintenance, et cetera. So the community of practice for them to actually engage with it is, is an activity that actually takes a bit of effort uh, which is a bit beyond their normal uh, work, uh, the, the, the normal work practices that they have. Um, also, if in, in, in many water utilities, uh, a lot of employees go from crisis to crisis, uh, and that means that time is scarce. Um, and when the workload is high, then the, you know what what a, what a staff member, what an employee will do is they will concentrate on their core activities. Knowledge exchange, sharing experiences are not core activities. And that means that contributions to a community of practice are going to be uh, relatively neglected. Also, members prefer regional clustering. Uh, so for, for example, the members in Latin America would prefer to have a Spanish COP, but that also means that these regional COPs are going to be relatively small. And then you have challenges relating to the 991 rule. Um, and so what is happening at the moment is we have a community of practice. We have nine communities of practice, which uh, have 1,200 members, which is having an impact. But Waterworks has indicated that they will stop moderation and support of these uh, communities of practice in 2024. The Bebo project ends in 2025. And that means there will be no support for no external support for these communities of practice. And then the question is what happens with these communities of practice after 2024, 2025? Uh, we've had discussions about how to about the future of these communities of practice. On the one hand, there is this agreement that you know they are, they are important tools for utility staff to exchange knowledge, to gain knowledge, to share knowledge. But at the same time, they are they don't seem to be sustainable by themselves. As, as one of the participants during the discussion mentioned, the history of the wash sector is littered with failed communities of practitioners. And as things are now, it is likely that these communities of practice will probably join this group of failed communities of practitioners after 2025. Um, so it's very difficult for these communities of practice to become self-sustaining. And it's very difficult to sustain these communities of practice. And it's given the, the current uh, uh, structure of these COPs with 1,200 members, it is unlikely that they will be sustainable after 2025. And I think the main question I have is if that is a problem. I mean, is it these communities of practice because they have an impact Perhaps you know it's not so bad that with external funding being required over a longer period of time, this impact can be guaranteed. Sorry, thank you. I am involved in a DUPC3 project with the beautiful name Smallholder Farming Families Adapt African Alluvial Aquifers to Strengthen Their Own Resilience. But that only started a few months ago, but the predecessor was called A4 Labs. And that is what I would like to talk about. 
did A4 Labs have impact? And I speak on behalf of uh, many of our partners, which I will, at the end of my presentation, will mention. So this is the outline of my presentation, which I don't want to dwell on. This is a typical view of a sand river. And it occurs in very dry areas. And this is perhaps six months after the last rains. And you can see that there is riparian vegetation, which is green, meaning have access to water. Where do they get the water from? That's not so very complex because oftentimes the water is very shallow underneath of the sand, as you can show, as you can see on this slide. Nice, isn't it? And they occur perhaps on 15% of the land area of Sub-Saharan Africa. So it is significant. But they occur in areas that are often considered marginal to socioeconomic development. And this is partly due because of the water scarcity they experience. Now, A4 Labs was, has been working in three regions where sand rivers occur, in Ethiopia, Tigray, in uh, Zimbabwe, in Matabele and South, and in uh, Mozambique, in the Gaza province. And the A4 Store project adds three other partners that I will mention perhaps later. But what is perhaps interesting is that the presentation of Violet Matiru yesterday on the Ati River in Kenya also mentioned the Makweni and Kajado areas and where beautiful sand rivers occur. And the problems are, are very specific there that uh, we can mention later. So A4 Labs started in 2016-17 and ended in 2022. Um, it aimed to promote the use of water stored in sand rivers by resource poor smallholder farmers for irrigation in order to enhance their resilience in Ethiopia, Mozambique, and Zimbabwe. And we wanted to do this also with action research together with farmers. And this is uh, the concept that we developed with our partners. So this is the typical sand river. And by drilling a small well point, either inside the riverbed or next to the riverbed, if the, the underground here is connected to the sand river, and a small solar pump, and then farmers can start to irrigate. What is important to realize is that for this option, you do not have to build an irrigation canal or an irrigation reservoir, because the reservoir and the canal is already given by nature. Therefore, this is a relatively cheap option available also to resource poor farmers. Now, to, just for you to get a feel of it, this is a, a plot of Donna Anita in Mozambique. And this is in a dry season. And this is her plot of 2,000 square meters, which is all irrigated. And in the far end, you can see the Limpopo River, which is largely a sand river. OK, this you already saw. <clears throat> now, what was the intended impact of A4 Labs? There were several. The first is we wanted to improve the vulnerable dryland livelihoods of resource poor smallholder farmers. And the second one is we wanted to influence policymakers and practitioners by influencing their irrigation policies, namely that sand rivers are a viable water source, because in uh, several countries, this was in the countries that we were studying, this was not really well known and that irrigation development can focus on individual farming families rather than on groups of farmers in an irrigation scheme. Of course, we also intended to have other impacts, but these are not uh, covered here in this presentation. Which intended impacts were achieved? First, the resource poor smallholder farmers. We showed that irrigation development along sand rivers in parts of Mozambique, Ethiopia, and Zimbabwe is indeed a viable, feasible, and reliable livelihood options for resource-poor farmers. And 
we have improved 19, the livelihoods of 19 farming families, the majority of whom were female-headed households. And actually these female farmers were the most consistent of the farmers that were in our group. However, we will not, we don't know for sure whether their livelihoods will remain strong in the future. We hope so, and we have strong beliefs so, but we don't know for sure. We also acknowledge that the number of farming families that we reached in it, initially is still very small. And therefore we are happy that there is a follow on project. Here's an example of uh, one of the farmers that uh, benefited from our experiment and experimented together with us. And here she's starting up her, her uh, small pump. And the well point here is in the, in the center river connected aquifer. Th this is the same plot I just showed with the other video. This is Donna Anita. She is 67 years old. She's a widower. She doesn't speak Portuguese. She lives in Mozambique, but she can only speak Shangan. And she is very conversant with her plot and her new pump, which she has been operating now for six years successfully. And, and this is how, the, how then she applies the water to her crops, simply with a hose pipe. No big fuss. So what were the impacts that we had with policymakers and practitioners? That was a bit more challenging. We wanted to enrich the irrigation development portfolio in these three countries with new design options for sand rivers. To be honest, our achievements were modest and mainly focused in one of the three countries. And this can be made visible, it's concrete in, a, in, for instance, the mention of sand rivers in a new policy maker, sorry, a policy paper that they produced. What was also very interesting was that our activities came to be known by the Limpopo Watercourse Commission. And this is a, the commission that, that is in charge of the transboundary Limpo, Limpopo Basin, which comprises Botswana, uh, South Africa, uh, Mozambique, and uh, Zimbabwe. And of course, uh, these watercourse commissions tend to focus on the big things like building big dams and all that stuff. And we could show that irrigation development is possible without needing to build dams, even in relatively semi-arid to arid environments. We also convened special sessions at several regional conferences, which then promoted our ideas. And, our, and we, we developed a new concept, adaptive investment pathways, but this concept has not yet received significant buy-in. There was also an impact that we were not achieving. We had hoped and actually planned to especially target young farmers because we thought the young farmers will be ambitious to engage in this new project. But to our surprise, it proved difficult to engage them. The Sand River option that we pursued requires a full-time commitment in the field at least six days in the week, eight hours of work, which apparently happens to be not very appealing to those rural, rural youngsters that we tried to engage. Were there unintended impacts? Yes. What was very exciting in our project that the, some of the A4Labs partners compared ways how they technically drilled well points in the sand and how best to do this. And this yielded actually a new best practice. And the comparisons, the comparative analysis between Mozambican and Zimbabwean and Dutch technologists proved to be very interesting. And another unintended impact was that the, in the Tigray post-Civil War restoration program for rebuilding irrigation, now the solar pumps that we introduced in Tigray have become a standard solution. 
What lessons can we learn? First, action research is exciting, but you cannot go faster than the pace of those in charge of the experiments. And these were the farmers. You have to go with the flow. What was also very interesting was that the different partners designed the, the, the agreed actions in a very different way. And this may result in unexpected outcomes, sometimes for the better and sometimes for the worse. But the point is that all these are learning opportunities. And one of the example is the, the scheme irrigation development approach versus the individual farming uh, family approach. The monitoring proved difficult. And finally, but is, and I, sorry, uh, Micha, but I have to mention this, that, you know, A4 Labs wanted to prove the concept of, of using sand rivers. So there too, we, we donated a pump and a well point to the participating farmers. But in the new project, A4 Store, we want to see how we can promote this type of thing, whereby farmers pay back, pay for the pumps. And there too, we need revolving funds. And the donor involved did not allow us to finance such funds in Mozambique, Zimbabwe, Ethiopia, or elsewhere. And now we are trying to interest local governments and irrigation departments to fund such revolving funds. This is more difficult and more time consuming, but if we succeed, then the impact is likely to be much greater. Mm. The impact of Avo Labs was co-created by the farmers themselves and together with the partners involved and these were mainly those i want to thank you very much for your thank you. attention thank you peter and i'm sure uh very interesting oh. i'm sure some of those points you raised there also on the structure of projects and uh, are something that will will enter in our discussion in uh yeah. in, a, in, a, in, in the panel discussion um just looking here if there's any immediate questions that uh, that would pop up and that we uh, and i mean Maybe one question while we we'll switch to Elizabeth. Um, and there was a question that came up from Tsepa Motsamai here. Um, indeed, you focus very much on younger farmers, but maybe this is something we can also include in the panel discussion uh, later, because I think it's also interesting for these communities of practice. But how did that engage with farmers that are, you know, older farmers? Or, you know, so did you, you know, so, does it engage people across the board, if you like? Now, that was the, the, the amazing part that the the elderly farmers were the ones who who easily adopted the new technologies and and worked on it. So and it was their stamina, actually, their motivation where they used to perhaps irrigate by hands, you can imagine, yeah, or, or, or not at all. And they were so amazed by the water they could get with this small pump that they were, were happy to work and, and they didn't mind to, to spend six days a week in the field. So. But but we have to find ways also to engage the new generation. I think. Right, I think that's an interesting. But, but I don't know how this how we should be doing this. Help us. I would okay. say to yeah. Everybody gets thinking. Yeah. Because <laughs> with that, I'd like to move on indeed and very warm welcome to Elizabeth Lichtefoot. And um, Elizabeth is the director of IGRAC, um, which I don't know the exact acronym, but it's the Groundwater Research. Institute, and I'm sure she'll say the acronym of uh, of the UN. Um, it's a Category Two Institute, and uh, I think it's exciting because I think Elizabeth comes from a slightly different perspective into this discussion, which I think is really interesting. She's a hydrologist, hydrogeologist, um, with a broad experience in Latin America, Middle East, Southeast Asia, and the interests are obviously research in groundwater, but particularly so in arid and semi-arid environments, groundwater dependent ecosystems, um, the management of groundwater, and um, but also looking at that from yeah, local heritage and, and local and ancestral knowledge perspective. So excited to hear from you, Elizabeth. Take it away. Uh, you can share your thank you very much. Um, yes, let me uh, share. Oh, I don't know why. I cannot share. Before I add, but now, yes. Oh, here it comes. Yeah. Um, thank you. Thank you, Micha. Perfect. Um, 
So, um, so yes, as you said, I will uh, uh, not present uh, any uh, uh, the, uh, any project, <laughs> um, uh, but um, uh, uh, I will present the reflections uh, at organization level. And this organization is is IGREC, and you see it. It's a it, it's a long name, uh, International Groundwater Resources Assessment Center. Um, uh, so I have really a uh, few slides, uh, and and I will present uh, not, the reflection not only mine but also the team about impact at the level of our organization and the sustainability of impact. Um, Yes. Uh, so uh, yeah, about IGREC, it's uh, um, uh, briefly uh, uh, an independent organization based in Delft in the Netherlands, and we are between a research center, data center, knowledge hub, uh, working under the auspice of UNESCO and and WMO, but, but also with many other organizations. So we. As I rec envision a world where groundwater is used sustainably and equitably, but not only also a world where, where data information, knowledge about groundwater resources is, is known, is accessible, uh, and is accessible and to, to anyone who, who needs it. Uh, and so uh, uh, our with this mission, we, what do we do? We provide uh, uh, um, uh, evidence-based information and knowledge and groundwater worldwide, essentially to support decision-making. And the decision-making, it's, it's uh, 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 at different level and can be mainly high level to UN uh, agencies, but also at national level and uh, uh, hopefully uh, going down uh, to the users. Um, so um, we we try to go up in this pyramid uh, from data to information to knowledge, um, uh, assuming that uh, with knowledge uh, comes the awareness and the responsibility of and accountability and sustainable actions. Um, but yes, with the so ambitious um, uh, mission and vision. Uh, for a small team, uh, a small organization of uh, five, six person uh, in the Netherlands, so we are here in our partner of, of IHC, uh, uh, obviously there is a lot of questions. Um, what, what uh, uh, and, and IREC is 20 years this year, so it's a good moment also to, 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 to reflect. And what, so what are the impact of, of our work? Eh? And, and does our work has an impact, and and if there is an impact, uh, if is it positive, is it sustained? So and and when then, what are the drivers behind? So so yeah, I think that uh, uh, we we all development workers, researchers, we inherently assume that that we we do have an impact, but uh, it is uh, often uh, an assumption. So so starting to review the different activities, projects, products, tools developed. A, a, by IGREC eh, uh, during those 20 years, we found out that, and, and I'm sorry because uh, uh, unfortunately we uh, I cannot show any quantitative assessment of that, and, uh, but I hope that uh, that it will be possible soon. Uh, so it's it's a really a qualitative assessment. So we, we saw that many activities implemented at, at uh, barely maybe, merely a, a, a punctual impact, if any, uh, and with, when I speak about activities, well, mainly uh, workshop uh, or, or support that we can give uh, to, 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 to stakeholders, to countries, uh, through different ways. Um, um, so, uh, and hardly have any impact beyond the activities. And also many tools then eh, that uh, uh, we have developed, uh, for example, uh, uh, platform eh, for sharing information, data, uh, or guidelines to to implement or to 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 produce uh, information uh, and uh, uh, to analyze data. So many of those tools are often not used be, be after the the end of the of the project. So and. 
the causes are, are multiple eh? uh, when st uh, st starting to try to, uh, trying to to find out uh, um so yeah uh, so there is question like right? does this workshop was was responding to the needs and the needs comes first of course uh, of the participants and and does the methodology used was adequate and does the tool developed is responding also to to a need of the users is, is does the tool present a, a a lasting benefit for, for the users. But even assuming that we answer yes to all those uh, questions, uh, that this, this, those are mandatory yeah, uh, questions, and, 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 but, but not sufficient to ensure a sustainable impact. And, and, and there is, I mean, a lot of uh, information uh, points, issues that have been already raised in the, in the previous sessions. Uh, there are so many factors that can hinder uh, the impact, uh, finance, uh, etc. But at IGREC, we 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 identified what is under our our, um, our control. And that uh, where we can really uh, maybe change and eh, the way we are doing things. Um, so, uh, firstly, we saw that any action, project, activity, uh, uh, which is not integrated in 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 with in a strategy uh, in the local context in 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 uh, or integrated with other activities project initiative in the context have a uh, little chance to to have a, a, a lasting impact and this is this is really uh, um, this needs for a huge collaboration uh, between all actors and and this is absolutely not happening now uh, in in many in many uh, in many projects and, and context so this is one point and and uh, um the second point uh, I, I forgot to, to uh, pass the slide uh, the second point is that uh, our role is to support uh, local actors local partners uh, to be behind the curtains and so uh, we really uh, we are not enough knowledgeable of the local context to, to ensure what has been said before and to ensure that our uh, intervention uh, uh, will not have a, a negative impact. Or, and, and then uh, another decision that we took is really to have only and to open all our data information results, etc. And not only uh, it's important, but also it's not enough, uh, but engaging in, in an innovative communication way to ensure that the users and the decision makers that need this information can get, get easily the information uh, produced. Um, and then maybe the most important and the most uh, challenging point, uh, uh, how we, at the end of a project or after the, uh, the end of an activity, uh, uh, how we, 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 we follow up, we give support because we know that the ending of a project uh, uh, um, uh, probably and also the, the impact, no, uh, or, or the action. So, um, and there, the idea is, of course, it's a lot to work with donors uh, and how we can, uh, uh, with our programmatic funding out as all organization, as any organization, we have a programmatic funding, a core funding, and this is through the Water and Development Partnership Program, and we have projects. So how, are, with our programmatic core funding, we are able to, to, to give a follow-up to, to punctual of to one year, two year, three years project. No? So if we, in a project, we are strengthening the national uh, groundwater monitoring program of country, <clears> how <throat> then we can always be here somehow if there is a question, if there is a problem and, and be able not only to, maybe not to do ourselves, but to connect to tools. Who can, uh, but not to 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 finish all all uh, to disappear after uh, one point, and and uh, what I want to finish is, uh, yeah, um, uh, 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 as it has been mentioned, and this is the title of the of 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 the, the seminar the webinar, uh, uh, the young reporting impact. I think we have all a, a huge 
uh, responsibility uh, because what we see is that donors uh, uh, there is a need to educate somehow donors and and uh, uh, to to make them understand the reality on the ground and if we don't report correctly of of we put it always a uh, nicer uh, 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 the impact we had, the beneficiary who had, we don't serve the cause, uh, uh, and 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 we don't. But yeah, it's very difficult because we are always saying, okay, so if I put all negative in my report, uh, maybe I will not get funds next time. So um, this is all. A, I think a, a discussion that we have, reflection that we have to engage with donor, uh, and also maybe to accept our own limitations. I mean, uh, uh, in in this sustaining impact and that's all thank you very much thanks so much and i think you raised some extremely interesting points that i'm that i'm sure will come into the discussion particularly these these last reflections coming going back to donors and especially about yeah being honest with ourselves <laughs> i guess indeed and what we hope to achieve and before we go to the full uh, question and answer session or the, uh, the panel discussion um, I'd like to just ask one quick question from the from the audience here, in terms of what, yeah, what actors at what sort of level um, are the actors that you mainly um, target? You know, are they more institutional at the community or local level, and, um, and you know, so what what is your main sort of client, yeah. if you like? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> that is a very good question. And eh? one year and a half that we're working on that. No, but uh, <laughs> no, basically we we. Uh, mainly work at uh, international, so uh, uh, UN agencies and national level. Um, uh, this is our main uh, institution, but uh, uh, also national, but province. Uh, we work a lot with regional centers also, for example, uh, um, uh, but not at community level. Uh, yeah. Okay, which I think is also a great thing. I think it's very important to... Yeah. to no, and also what mandates it, one has, I think, as an organization, or what legitimacy one has as an organization. Exactly. Yeah. To 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 work with. Thanks. So thank you to well, a great hand to uh, <laughs> to the three um, presenters for very interesting reflections. I think on on different perspectives, and we'd like now to uh, yeah to open a slightly wider discussion, maybe also cutting across the uh, three the three presentations. Um, and um, so I'd like also to invite folks to uh, you know put questions that they have in the in the in the question and answers session. And indeed, Peter, <laughs> in great class, if you can also come on and uh, throw on your camera, there you go. And we understand your challenge, Peter, but we know that you're there. <laughs> um, I'd like to start, and it, it's an interesting question. I think um, you know it's 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 maybe something that you touched on, Elizabeth, about going from project to more programmatic. Um, I think um, Peter touched on it at, to some degree of, you know, starting also going from what I call beyond the pilot phase. And in a sense, class, you were also talking about this, that, okay, the establishing a community of practice, but okay, what happens next kind of thing? And um, so, yeah, I was kind, kind of thinking maybe starting with you, class, on that. So, you know, what lessons do sort of the implementers of community or practice take away from the implementation and how they carry that into their organizations. Because I guess what you mentioned that, okay, um, you know, when the people that say it's, they're doing it outside what they normally do. So they are, you're sort of asking them to do something extra, but how, how, you know, can it be maintained to be more meaningful? Um, you know, can you sort of translate the successes of the community of practice back into the service organization to maybe give it a space for people to make it more? Um, yeah, so I mean, what, what we notice with the communities of practice is that a lot of the the the, the real impact is is not seen. It's, it's not mm. visible in the community of practice. It's it's where one member contacts another member directly to because they're working on a similar issue, a similar thing, they ask, directly for help uh, and, and they communicate and they exchange knowledge. Um, but this is not visible in, in the community of practice as such. The community of practice is just sort of a, in, in the end, it's, it's you know, we, we organize events. Mm -hmm. We allow for the personal networks of these utility staff members to develop and to get to know other people that may be working in a similar activity. 
um, so that, that that makes it a bit difficult. Um, and and I, I I think I mean it, it, um, so I mean I I work for IIT Delft and and we we are a knowledge institute so we do knowledge management basically be it education or training or research. Um, but for a water utility employee, I mean knowledge management is sort of you know it's 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 interesting and and you know it's, it's relevant, but it's not their direct activity mm -hmm. and it just means that if uh, if there is a crisis work-wise or if there is something that needs to be done these kinds of activities are the first to go right. and that makes it and and you know this is also because i get these, these these questions particularly with the communities of practice you get these questions about how sustainable are they and i i you know th th they're not and um i i don't think that's a problem i mean if, if you look at the impact that it has versus the costs of maintaining them uh, be it externally funded uh, i think they are still worthwhile that's for, that's interesting. I mean, I, I would agree, but I mean, it's indeed that that challenge of. Yeah, I mean, if if you try to explain this to if you try to explain this to the Ministry of Foreign because, Affairs, they're not very happy with that. Right. So I think that leads immediately to your question. I think that Elizabeth raised, but I'd also like to ask it to Peter because you also raised it, and so maybe I'll do it a, a double hop because it just came in also from from Jennifer Borong, um, both to Elizabeth and Peter. So, you know. The, the sort of the donor's perspective, and I think I think that's also something that you just mentioned, actually, class. Sort of, you know, the language that maybe the the donors speak and their perspectives. How does that really actually, you know, determine the project sustainability? And you know, should should we maybe trying to change those perspectives or work with donors in different perspectives in setting up projects? And then, Peter, would you maybe comment on that, given what you just exposed? May you? Yep. Yes. Yeah, I think that, you know, problem in what we have for this, for supporting resource poor farmers who want to start irrigating from sand rivers, the support they need is very small. And we, we estimate it is between the 500 and the 1,000 euros or so, and they will be able to pay it even back. But it is for irrigation departments much easier to go to the World Bank and get a twenty million dollar loan for a large for developing a large irrigation scheme, which does a lot of harm, and which will not be properly maintained, than to give twenty thousand people a loan of a thousand, which is also twenty million, and they will even pay it back, and that is the quagmire. That is the big issue that I am faced. And that is what I would like to discuss with the PGGM, with Pit Klopp, and with all the banks and, and, and with the, the, the EFATs of this world, you know, the ADB, of how to solve that problem. Mm. Because the money is very little. But it is important that the farmers make themselves the investment because it should be theirs. Yeah. And you mentioned, I mean, maybe in, in that, you know, I was ever thinking that it's a bit of a scale issue, let's say, that maybe the thinking at, I don't know, some of the, 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 the institutions, the donors that you mentioned are thinking very large scale and there's maybe a disconnect from it because I think often the objectives are the same. Elizabeth, you, you mentioned also this going from a project to a more programmatic type approach, which I thought was quite interesting because I agree that often a project, you know, it has a lifetime, it comes to an end, we speak different languages, but programmatic already sounds different <laughs> so, yes yeah reflections. yeah i think this is a um uh yeah uh, well, how we can uh uh focus and and integrate in in our programmatic uh, uh in our program long-term programs and funds uh, uh, the follow-up of the project. That means that all should be very aligned and very focused and somehow, uh, the project and the, the programs. Um, uh, but that, yeah, there is also really a, a, a need to, to um, uh, much more, I mean, regarding donors, uh, 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 
I mean, we have to, the, the reporting is very important. And, and often we, we do not measure impact on, mm. on uh, uh, and sometimes because we cannot, because the end of the project, I mean, you measure the impact from the end of the project. So, so uh, how we, we can uh, then, uh, but there's, I think there is a long-term uh, um, relationship with the donors and the discussion and conversation uh, discussion that we have to 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 that we need to have uh, and 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 to integrate always a follow up uh, um, yeah so uh, it it's not easy because of course uh, um, yeah 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 got it certainly well i was thinking in this follow up uh, because i I think that's interesting, and it, it often depends a little bit on on all sorts of, you know, in a sense, also opportunities, and you know, that's I think that's that's the reality. I think being realistic, um, to what degree, and I think that's, you know, maybe across setting up communities practice, and maybe the A4 lab example, um, and of course, IGREC is more programmatic, but in let's say projects do we give space to that let's say space to this question of sustainability of um bring perhaps bringing that in line indeed with as you mentioned elizabeth uh, with you know national plans or something so it actually fits into what's already going on and i think class you 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 also tipped on that is that something that we should spend more focus on or what's the reflection there Elizabeth, uh, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's interesting. Maybe the the, the sustainability um, uh, issue sh should should be uh, dealt by by the by the beneficiaries, no, or the countries. I mean, depending on the level of you of who you are working, and and uh, this is something that should be discussed at the beginning, and and with the donors, with the beneficiaries and uh, other countries or the uh, and, and we decide I mean we know that it's difficult so how we will deal with the 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 the, the impact and the sustainability how we will measure it uh, how we'll be sure that uh, we have a positive impact and that this is sustained so maybe this is something that we, it's not all on our responsibility uh, I mean the implementers or uh, uh, it's something that we have to share right, we, right. That's an interesting. Thank you. Um, I see, indeed, um, a hand has been raised by Anna Hammond. Um, apparently, I think you can't put something in the questions. Would, would you like to pop your question? And I'm reaching out also to the technical. Hi, Anna. There we, yeah. Thanks, you can Anna. now unmute your mic and ask your question if you would like to. Anna Hammond, are you still here? I do, I do see her. Uh, sorry, um, I didn't raise my hand. That was a technical problem. Sorry. Uh, okay, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> we, weren't, we weren't sure because we you, your hand keep coming up. So we thought we'd give you space there. <laughs> um, okay, so, sorry, that changed my flow now. <laughs> Um, also, just just a reminder. Um, there's also some quite specific questions that are coming in on the on the question and answer. That's to the panelists. So, you know, specific questions to IGRAC and to class and uh, and also to Peter. And you know, please take your time also afterwards to uh, to to respond to those. Um, let me see. Um, yeah, maybe coming back. Um, Back to this 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 question on on donor funding, and I'm, I'm coming back to you, class, also, um, and maybe we can follow up with Peter also on let's say the this, the sustainability of of these um, let's say this approach that you that you're presenting on the on the sand rivers. Um, do you know about the class about the existence of 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 communities of practice that that are then not supported by donor funding? I mean, I'm sure that there are communities of practice that that exist and that flourish. Um, or, or maybe not, <laughs> um, without that key component. And um, yeah, what, what, you know, what makes those work, what makes those tick, and maybe are they too much under the radar when we, when we design, let's say, these community of practice initiatives as, as you presented? Yeah, I mean, um, I mean th th there are 
I think most of the communities of practice, especially when they start up, they will need some kind of, uh, I mean, not necessarily, perhaps not necessarily donor funding, but it could be, some, it needs some kind of organization or institute needs to support uh, the community of practice. Um, the, and I think this is also quite interesting in terms of the comparison with, with, with Peter, is that, so the communities of practice and the knowledge exchange that they do within the water operator partnerships and, and the people project is not necessarily um, the, the immediate work that they do. And I think with Peter, with his mm. project, it's it's much the, the, the direct link with uh, mm. daily subsistence and daily activities is, is, is a bit stronger. In in the case of my communities of practice, uh, you know, it, it's it's it, it, it is almost for utility staff member. It makes more sense to reinvent the wheel mm. than it does to invest time in a community of practice. Although if you would look at it, you know, at, at the end, ultimately it's it's a lot more efficient and a lot more effective if you would invest time in a community of practice. But it's, it's simply the incentives that a, that a staff member has would prefer that or, or, or would, would lead them to, to reinvent the wheel rather than invest mm. in a community of practice. And that's a very difficult. That, that, yeah. That's a very difficult. Um, yeah, thing to, to to break. Yeah. Yeah. Peter, would you want to re respond to that? Because then I think it's it's interesting to link about what is the incentive of, let's say, you know, indeed a farmer and, and living next to the Limpopo River, for example, to engage with um, you know this approach. Um, what are your thoughts? Yeah, my thoughts are a bit, you know, but 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 is amazing in, in the experience that we have in, in a few countries is that the government departments are not aware of the scope of the water availability in sand rivers. They, they think that these were these are dry rivers. Mm -hmm. Although the local people, they still remember, and that this is really true. The big drought we had in Southern Africa was in 1992. It was a huge drought. It has not repeated itself, fortunately, yet. And we have several stories of people who says all the well dry, wells dried up, except the water in the sand rivers. So uh, it, it is a fairly reliable resource, but uh, still there are proposals, for instance, in the Limpopo to build a big dam in, in Mapai. And then I think, OK, God has already built the dam. It's a nature based storage there. And let's first utilize that source before we, 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 we develop large infrastructure and we engage donors. So we do not even have need much donors. What is need, needed is that it is cheap for smallholder farmers to borrow money. And that is very difficult because they need very little money, but the, it's very difficult to get cheap money. It's very expensive. If you are poor, you don't have the money, you have to borrow it. So the best is that you get it from your uncle or your brother or your sister. And that is perhaps the best uh, development option, if you think about it. Yeah, I was thinking also about about incentives, let's say, to Yeah, I mean, I, I, I can but totally... It's okay. And, and we are working closely with the irrigation departments, and I know them very well, because I've been trained yeah. in the same way as they have been trained, thinking in large schemes and in, in, in all the, those type of things. And to have a farmer-led approach mm. is is alien to 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 the to the trade of irrigation, and that's what we have to uh, to engage with. I'm 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 really sure about it. So that's maybe I don't know working at that level, which is also maybe the work that you know, the level that IGRAC works at, huh? but yeah. with as you say, these institutions of. Because I mean that's also an incentive question, I guess. You know, that's someone who's working at, at the more institutional level to yeah, you know, to consider that or to engage with that. I don't know, Elizabeth, have you any do you any other thoughts on yeah. that? Yeah, yeah. And, and this is the challenge of groundwater. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's, it's yeah, it's making more difficult because it's 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 hidden um and um and and you cannot see the impact uh, uh, sometimes decades or um, uh, long long term. Um, so this is a big challenge. So that's why I mentioned quickly. Yeah, but um, but just as a reflection, also we really have to uh, um, uh, think about uh, communication 
and how we communicate, how we engage with uh, this needed knowledge, um, uh, but not the way we have been doing it up to now. It does, doesn't work. Uh, so, um, so yeah, uh, with stories, with uh, we, uh, with serious gaming, with uh, mm. even with institutions, huh? uh, um, and this is done even in, in I mean in in Europe or in uh, in in the I mean, the Netherlands uh, right. uh, um, to 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 pass messages uh, um, and. Or, yeah, there is, there is, I think we, this is where we need to be innovative. <laughs> How to cross those. That's an interesting, yes. I'd like to, I see that there's a couple of questions also in the, um, in the, um, let's say, in the hands raised. <laughs> so, um, Mohammed, you, Rahman, do you have a question that you would like to pose to the panelists? And, um, I think we can give you permission to talk. Can I do that? Go, go ahead, Mohammed. Mohammed, are you there? If not, then maybe we can park your question. And I would like to uh, ask Ivan Rodriguez, who's an ex-student of yours classes, <laughs> class. <laughs> So uh, you know each other. That's really great that you're here. Ivan, you had a question. Ah, OK, sorry. I'll come back to you, um, Mohammed, after Ivan. I see that I have to do the unmuting. I didn't know that. I think you're both unmuted. Ivan, could you uh, pop your question? I think I, I see in the chat that you can unmute yourself. Ah, your mics may not be working. We still seem to be challenged uh, <laughs> with. Um... Let me see. I don't see any. Uh... Okay, <laughs> sorry for that. That's uh, um, let me see. Well, may maybe I'm not sure if we can um, get the let's uh, get the technology to work. So, so maybe coming back a little bit to, uh, to also reflecting on a question in the in the, in the chat, which which actually started with class, but. I think it, you know, Peter, you also addressed it, and 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 maybe to some extent Elizabeth. But this question about, you know, what professional backgrounds are are engaging um, in these communities of practice, for example. So, um, I mean, I think this this ninety nine one ratio is quite interesting, right? That that okay, you know, we we engage with a lot of people, but in the end, it's it's let's say it's a small selection of people who actively remain engaged, and it, it depends on that. And and the question is, you know, what what's professional backgrounds um, is dominant in that and um, and do you see sort of big differences across this 99-1 ratio so you know there's many wide range being engaged but there's a very specific you know, number of people now that have, have their special specific interests and maybe I think that was also something that came up some people someone said yeah we want new technologies or something right so do you see something like that like the, the specific specific interests and in sort of in the groups that are involved class um we i mean we we, we see that there are uh, so you have people who have a certain affinity for a particular topic so there's also for example there's one cop on on customers and uh customer management and then you know you have two or three people who all of a sudden are extremely engaged with some kind of software and mm -hmm. what, what we notice is that initially that discussion takes place on uh, on the platform within the COP, but quite quickly they, you know, they find each other and they move away from the COP and they basically start their own small uh, mm. group. So I mean, I, th I think with the COP that we have at the moment, they they create a lot of spin-offs, mm. but these spin-offs are are not very visible, and that makes it also very mm. difficult to 
you know, in, in terms of impact, uh, there is always a lot of question about it. What, what is the impact of your project and can, can you show the impact? And that, that is very difficult if, if it's not very visible. Where, where I, as I would say that, you know, um, creating spin-offs is a, is a, is a great thing. Right. right. Right, That's, but uh... but 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 the thing is that these spin-offs are not necessarily registered, or it's not you know mm -hmm. I mean it's just it's just More. members who contact each other directly, and then they you know who they, see they... a need, who see a yeah. need, <laughs> and and yeah. they have a I mean this is I think perhaps also the link to the technology. I mean they they have a certain affinity or a certain appreciation or a certain in, mm. interest in in that particular topic that they you know that that they really care about, but it's it's what what I notice is that these people tend to start their own smaller communities that yeah. that we don't really that, that don't really register for us thanks a lot class i see now in the in the, in the chat indeed um if ivan the space to uh, ask a question Ivan, yes. hello can you hear me now perfectly okay sorry sorry for that okay hello hello class hello everyone uh i think to try to look for incentives in COPs, uh, my my best advice. I, I have 22 years working in a water utility, so my best uh, advice would be to to keep uh, to try to look for for uh, projects that can be put or ideas that can be put in place. So, community community of practice is about practice. So let's practice. So the idea to to try to to mobilize funds and 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 try to to keep people uh, on the loop is to try to mimic the the private sector. Uh, for instance, when was the the COVID the the pandemic? Uh, the private sector uh, uh, also uh, in the water utility uh, uh, sector, they they uh, created uh, some uh, communities for try to implement some technologies to improve the health and sanitation as well. So my idea would be that uh, if we if we try to just as class said, try to not not reinvent the, the wheel and try to put in place some technology that is working already in a bigger utilities or bigger uh, actors, uh it's it's good to to implement those ones in latin america africa asia and once you have the technology in place it will bring knowledge it would it would bring new um new public management and and so on so my my advice would be that try to try to mimic the the private sector to put uh to mobilize funds so thank you. Thanks, uh, thanks, Ivan. Quick response, uh, class, and then it may be interesting to hear about Peter and Elizabeth about this question of the private sector. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, it's it's it, it is about the. I mean, I I agree that it's about the mobilization of funds. Um, but you know, th th and this is I think also what. So so the the question of sustainability is linked to this mobilization of funds. And once that mobilization of funds is is not successful for whatever reason, it also basically means the end of the COP. So it's a continuous. It's 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 a you know it's it's sustainable for as long as the funding is there. And that's a bit the challenge of of of, of a COP. Maybe a quick go and we won't come into a close here. But Elizabeth, also, what do you think about private sector, also in in groundwater and sustainability? Because I think there's so some questions even on the chat about you know, sustainability, groundwater, and um, <laughs> this mobilization of funds by the private sector. Reflections, if you have. Yeah, I mean, it, it, this is they, they are key, of course, uh, and and uh, um, um, because they, they they are also main users uh, of of groundwater. Um, I'm speaking as as, as a resource huh? and 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 thinking about the the the, the protection and the um, and the wise management of the of the resource. So uh, in this sense, they 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 are part. Um, 
yeah, so uh, we have a lot of discussion at IGREC about uh, engaging, uh, of course, funds and uh, from the private sector, and uh, which uh, sh could be uh, um, uh, uh, engaged. I mean, uh, of course, this 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 is a. a, a, a I think we, we 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 anyway have to engage uh, because uh, with them um, and uh, um, um, yeah that, that they are part uh, uh, may, often in the local context that they are part of the of the actors and uh, uh, and probably um, but uh, yeah it's also difficult to 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 yeah to to make part of sometimes. I mean, how you 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 assume other agendas, no? Uh, uh, that you cannot control. This is the the main problem. Thanks, thanks, Peter. Also, I mean, I think that's also an interesting question of maybe in a completely different context. But but I would love to listen to Lapo. I'm glad to give <laughs> my friend. Give, <laughs> give you the twenty seconds for you, and then Lapo comes in. <laughs> <laughs> no, but but I, I I've said enough. I think so. I'm just curious to know what Lapo's uh, view is on on this session. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. <laughs> and what else can I do now? But uh, indeed, because indeed we we come to the close of the discussion. So thanks very much for that. And sorry that we had some technical challenge. And I'd like now to hand over to Lapo to give probably quite challenging reflections on uh, on on what uh, what has been heard. <laughs> Thank you. Challenging. Um, good afternoon. My friends want to hear from me. Hi, Peter. And hi, everybody. Um, yeah. Um, like I said in the beginning, I'm really excited for us to have this dialogue. I think it was just about time. Um, I started off um, thinking in a particular way, and I ended up uh, at a completely different space altogether. Initially, I, I thought, you know, we need to introspect and uh, think about why do donors and experts do what they do? Why do we engage uh, as a development experts in these things? What exactly do we want out of this? And I was thinking that, are we sure we are abreast or quite confident of the capability and capacity of those who you want to impact to actually carry on the impact all the way into the future as we want impact sustainability. That is where I started. I started by thinking that we are all wrong in our approach in terms of uh, assuming that those who we want to impact can be actually be impacted in the way that we are doing things that we might have to have a mind shift or a different thinking in whether we have really reviewed and uh, are sure that the impact that we want to bring can actually be received. Have we looked into what people are facing in terms of their you know, uh, 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 social standing, in terms of their economic standing, and in terms of the environment within which they exist? Are they able to receive what we want to, how we want to impact them? And um, um, and uh, are we able to deal with such things as capture? Because what has happened a lot is that there is usually lack of impact because the resources, especially the ideas, um, get captured for different reasons that we did not intend them for. In other words, um, when we get into um, uh, uh, situations that we want to impact, we tend to be to go along with uh, already empowered stakeholders like NGOs, like uh, government institutions. You know, we tend to be interested in those, or we get pulled by those because they they tend to be on the same platform as us. So, in other words, I was saying maybe we need to step back and level the platform of engagement so that those who we really want to be impacted can be impacted that's one two it can be sustainable because it's carried by them so i'm telling you that this is where i started but then i changed altogether after i had the presentations the presentations actually pointed to there is impact but we are unsatisfied with it and we are not able to report it 
I think the 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 the, the, the example of um the uh, of, of BOP um class presentation of the COPs. I think we are we want uh, impact that we can take further. Um, we are known, we donors and we experts to want to know where do we go from here, to want to, to, to by, by doing a particular project, we want to initiate the next project. And this is why we want to see impact that we can see either with our reading eyes or with our mind eyes. When you, uh, you, you present a class, I found that the networking happens as intended. The intention here was to create a platform for interaction and networking and general communication by practitioners. The problem is they took it offline, off the main platform that was created. It remains impact, but we can't follow it. And the way donor funding works and the way we experts work is that we have to be able to trace it. That's not a, a bad thing, but the problem is when we think impact is actually not happening. So for me, I think there were spin-offs, although the spin-offs were not visible because they were outside the platform. Now, of course, there are expenditures in terms of expertise, in terms of technology, in terms of all the resources that are spent in creating the platform. So can we just create it for something that is for an invisible impact? That is very difficult for us. And that is where I say what to do because there is invisible impact. But you did say something that was very interesting. You said um, um, a lot of the people who were in the COP that was created with a big number of people, 12,000, I think, um, wanted preferred regional and small. I think really small is good. People feel comfortable and can participate better in small. Unfortunately, sometimes in our donor driven, we want to see big. We want big, we want visibility. So I got a lot more on this because this uh, project was a big example of um, how I had changed my mind now to say, in fact, there is um, impact. We are just complaining that we can't see it. If we go on to the four labs, I believe that, you know, almost the same story. The only thing that I can bring out here that was uh, interesting um, and a little different from what happened here is um, the intended impact on the youth, where um, the project had a, a, a hope that the, the sustainability of improvement of livelihoods could be carried over by the young people um, who would then uh, invest in this uh, thing. And also another thing that happened here that was uh, the issue was that the project felt that um, the impact on policymakers was insignificant. The policymakers were not interested in this thing. Luckily, uh, we, we, have, we have had a very good session in that the session kept answering each other. Then came in um, Elizabeth. Elizabeth, one line that answers Peter's uh, issues was that sometimes when you have an activity which is not integrated in the strategy, in the, lo in the local context strategy, that can be a problem for sustainability. In order for something to be sustainable, the program, and we must have, of course, a, a program approach, but the program must emphasize on strengthening local level programs. In other words, there is nothing wrong. Actually, there is everything good about the sand rivers, but we dig in into the local strategy, into the national frameworks and see where we can embed it so that it can be carried over by the local actions in order for it to be sustained into the future. I, 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 I at the end, as, as, as the, the speakers were concluding here, they did, um, um, uh, uh, speak about uh, 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 what about uh, uh, the, the, I think it, we went back to the spin-off again. The spin-off and the impact depends on whether in the national or local frameworks, whatever the project is bringing can be embedded somewhere in order for it to be carried over by the locals. I must make a special mention of what Peter said um, about the financing of uh, the, 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 the future and, and talked about borrowing money from family. In fact, in Southern Africa, that is a serious 
and real development strategy is called metelo, meaning you pour into each other, where families come together and um, uh, contribute a bit of money for one of them to invest in something. And then the following, the next time there is a, a, a coming together, investing in one of the family members, so on and so on, doing a metelo, pouring onto each other like that. In fact, I think where a small amount uh, is needed for investment where the big banks and uh, big donors would find it insignificant as we found that the invisible spin-offs were insignificant. Where it is like that, they, oh, I'm told to, that, that is time away. Where it is like that, I think the pouring into each other can be a strategy to do. So sometimes these things have to be very local and home brewed in order for them to have impact that you can see. For me, that was my take from this uh, very beautiful project and uh, a very timely and necessary conversation that we had to have. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Lapo. And I think that's really a wonderful, wonderful reflection also to end this discussion. And, and actually a kind of a, a phrase that comes up to me immediately is one which Elizabeth, I think, recognizes very much, but not just on groundwater, is making the visible, the invisible visible. So not just making groundwater visible, which is extremely challenging, but also making impacts which might happen through spin-offs and other small connections that may not be in the indicators that we, you know, making those visible and thinking about that visibility of impact is maybe uh, a nice uh, yes, closing Peter, thought to this discussion. Uh, Peter, I just forgot one point. Where, ah, go ahead, uh, Lapa. <laughs> Said, donors need to be aware of that and accept their limitations. I think we also need to reach that point as well, that we have to be aware that we push experts to a place where they want big, huge impacts, mm -hmm. where actually small incremental impact, which have a multiplier effect, would be the best. Right. Thank you. Right. Again, visibility. Thank you so much. And I would like to thank Big Hand to Lapo, to Elizabeth, to Klaas, to Peter. And of course, most of all, to the whole audience, um, that with the, and thank you for the patience uh, for, for, for staying with us. If you have more questions, please do reach out to the presenters uh, through email. Um, and you know some of the questions have been answered. And sorry for not attending to all questions. Thanks so much to Ayn and Ellen and um, for doing the, the, the technical backstopping here. And um, with that, uh, I'll hand over. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you very much, Micha. Um, so you already thanked all of the panelists and the speakers and the attendees today, but we would also like to thank you. Um, so we would like to end the day or the session with thanking yeah, the amazing moderator and rapporteur that we had for this insightful session. Uh, and to all of the speakers for enriching us by sharing work and experience uh, from the field. So this is already the end of day two of our symposium. Uh, we would like to thank all of you for your time and attention and insights and questions that you shared with us. Uh, so tomorrow we will begin the day again at 2 p.m. Uh, CET with what remains to be our most awaited session. Um, well, whereas this session was amazing as well, of course. Uh, so the panel is something that's happening tomorrow, which is a panel for sharing failures and learnings. So we thank you, first of all, for all of your patience as we experienced some technical failures uh, during this very session. And we hope to learn from it uh, for tomorrow's session. So we will leave it at this. Uh, we will leave the webinar open for five more minutes to allow you to complete your conversations, exchange contacts and um, chat in the chat box. Uh, so we thank you again for joining and have a great evening. <laughs>